So, so, thank you, thank you. Um, so you can't um, get trapped so around, around myself. I, I got my BS in computer science, science from, from Lincoln, from Wesley, Lincoln Philly. Wesley and Philly. And then I and co founded my first startup in Edge Space, space with, with five, other five other developers, developers which, which was, very terrible, was very terrible because, because we all just started, we all just started developing and there was no designer. So I decided so to take, I a, step to take a step back after like just after four, months. four months. And then I started designing, and I started designing without knowledge of what I was doing, obviously. And then, but I really learned after a year. And after a year, like this is what I wanted so to do. I went so back I went to school, back to school to get my master's, get in, my master's in human computer interaction at Bentley. Um, and then I focused on design. And during that process, I found that Trometer. And um, as you can see, so pretty much the idea for Trometer is um, it's a cross platform application that can imply that can plan your entire vacation to anywhere in the world in less than 45 seconds based on your budget and preferences. And it's 100% free. So what I do is I lead our engineering team. I write 100% of our algorithm, and I also lead our design experience. And during that process, I founded non-UI, which is what I'm gonna be talking about today. So, in 2009, the then CEO of Hire to Tells um, came up with an idea for an experience he wanted to give to guests who came to the hotel. Now, Hyatt has been getting a lot of bad reviews, you know, a lot of terrible experiences. Shareholders are really upset, and he wanted to shake things up. And along the way, he read something on the internet, which is very interesting, um, that people go to Walmart, and then they could pay for the groceries, and then pay for the next person. And that was really nice. It made the person feel good. And likewise, if you get to a tow boat, what do you do? You could pay for yourself, or you could pay for the car coming behind. So he thought about this and said, the best way to fix all of the complaints that users were having when they go to the hotel was to provide random acts of kindness. So you could get things like, uh, uh, great. You could get things like free room service, free upgrades, you know, you could get free massage, and all of these really beautiful things. And somehow, if you got all of this, you were going to just stop feeling like, you know, the, the pies uh, are not frozen and they're not dead in terrible places that they shouldn't be. The room service isn't terrible. Somehow you would forget all of this if he gave you this random act of kindness. And um, you don't need to be a prophet to know that this didn't work and it failed terribly. Um, beyond the retrospect that we know this would fail because it wasn't attending to the user's concerns, we can measure why it fails. Now, the two ways you can do this. You can do this through a customer journey map, which a lot of you might have heard about, but there's one more way you can do this, and that is what we're going to be talking about today, the experience map. So, when you use your app, the different touch points you go through, that is the experience the customer or the traveler or wherever it is, would engage with by the time they get through your app. And this means that they could go from a very terrible experience, which is the worst thing your app can do, all the way to a very delightful experience. So in our case, you can imagine that maybe when searching for the hotel, that was a good experience, or they were having something that was really nice. And then when they started reading the property review, it was just terrible. It says nothing about a room. You have no idea what type of bed is in it. And then you can keep going, and when you get to the guest information where you tell them your name, okay, that wasn't bad, that experience goes up. Now when it's time to get, when it's time to pay for this hotel, it, it needs your phone number to have the dash, or it needs you to make sure that you don't have any space in, and that experience breaks. By the time you measure all of this, you can tell where your users are suffering and what you need to improve. So, how do we then go from this frustrating experience all the way to a delightful one? And when we mean a delightful experience, we mean an experience where the user just feels like everything works. Like, Jumping to that, you must first go through a satisfactory experience. Before you would make me be so happy, I have to first be okay with the service that I'm requesting. And here's the first thing we deal with, the frustrating experience. There are platforms that utilize frustration to be able to retain users. Like, have you tried deleting a Facebook account? It's almost impossible. Like, you have to go through so many steps, and that is intentional, it's a dark design. But there are also platforms that have built frustration into the system without knowing it. Like if you're going with a family and you want to book 
of your seats on United Airlines, don't do it. It's one of the worst experiences you would have if you want to book a seat for multiple people. Um, but then, if they're able to go over that frustrating experience, that means the user will then be satisfied. For a user to be satisfied with a product, it means one thing, your product is usable. Usable means it does what it's supposed to do. If you stretch out your ham, Miona should come to you. That's pretty much what usable is. So if you can get Thor to get his hammer, your product is usable. But we don't want to stop there. We want to get them to a place where they're delightful. To do that, the experience has to be seamless. That means the users can go from A to B and feel like there's nothing holding them back. Imagine driving and you don't have any cops on the road. You just keep going. I mean, don't go too fast, but you just keep going and there's nothing stopping you. That's the idea of having a delightful experience. It's like falling in love for the first time. That's really how it feels. That same feeling, if you've been there, that same feeling is what your application gives. And there are very few products that have achieved this, that I've used. One of them is Lemonade Insurance. How many of you have used that or you know about it? What is your experience? How great is it? It is awesome. It's the best insurance thing ever. And insurance is very terrible. Lemonade is really good. What they do is um, they help you to get your insurance and your claims in seconds. And so most times you don't even have to talk to anybody to do it. And then there's also the Bunch app, and I encourage you guys to check it out. It's really beautiful. It's an AI coach that can help you with pretty much any kind of development you want to go through. And the last one is called Revolut. I think it's a UK company, and they're really awesome in how they can help you transfer money from one country for, from one currency to the next. These guys really get it when it comes to seamlessness and how they help transfer users from one place to the next. And it's like what Steve Jobs says. Design is not just how it looks, it is really how it works. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. How do we go from a frustrating experience to a delightful one? So, I introduce you to non-UI. The idea of non-UI is that you can seamlessly, without any stress, in the least amount of effort, transition your users. And sometimes that would require no effort from them. But in doing that, it must answer the question, what does the user want to do? Or more specifically, what does the user want to do on this page? So to answer this question, the first thing we do is anticipate, like I said again, what the user wants to do. So I'll give a very good example. If I'm booking my flight and I'm selecting my seat, if I go to the seat map, what is the reason for going there? To select my seats, right? If I select my seat and I leave the app, but I go back to the seat map the second time, Whoa. Ah, it's technology. Okay. If I go back to the seat map for the second time, can someone tell me what am I going back for? If I already have my seat selected the first time, but I'm going back the second time, any idea what I might be going back for? Change my seat. Also, I might be going back just to know what the heck did I select? I already forgot. So when you consider what are the different possibilities, what are the things the user is thinking on this page, the next thing you want to do is start designing for it. How can I make them get that in the least amount of effort? Sometimes, like I said, no effort might be required from them. And once you do that, it means you've removed every complexity or you've reduced the actions to the barest minimum. So, when you start doing that, you're going to experience one of four things, or sometimes all four of them, and this is what I call the different types of non-UI. The first is the system design, the second is the friction, the driver, and the anticipatory design. System design asks one particular question. Does our default experience help or hinder a user's goal? So, if you have a frustrating experience and you want to move from frustrating experience to a satisfactory one, you have to deal with system design. System design says the current design you have, what is it achieving? Is it helping the users or is it obstructing them? So let's check out a case study. Now this is a very interesting one. It's called a $300 million button. Now there is um, an e-commerce company that sells lots of nine stuffs and you know somehow somebody there decided that after you've gone through the entire shopping, you've added things to your cart and you're ready to pay for it, you have to register or sign in. Without that, you can't pay for it. And this is what it thought. 
They thought the users wouldn't care about it. You know, they would just go through it like it's nothing. But every time the users come to this page, this is what they get. You cannot go on. So the users decided to do this. I'm just not going to pay for it, and I'm going to leave your site. So, and the big statement they made is, I'm just here to shop, not get into a relationship with you. So what did the company do? They changed it. They took out the register button, and they changed it for a continue button, so now you don't have to register. And in fact, just to make sure you understood how serious it was, they added this interesting statement. You do not need to create an account. You can just continue and pay for it. And this was the result. The soft 45% of increase in the sales, which amounted to over $300 million. One button. Just one. That's how crazy it is with how systems can prevent businesses from growing. The next thing I want to talk about is a friction design. The reason it's called friction is that the choices the users might want to make that we don't think is good for them, or we would want them to think twice before they take those actions. So it tries to prevent errors or mistakes that could lead to undesired results. Now, if you implement friction, you're now going from a satisfactory design all the way to a delightful one. To get to a satisfactory design, you have to fix the system. To go beyond that, you have to start implementing the other types of non-UI. So let's look at another case. I don't know how I many of you have used Google, where maybe you're filling a form, or for some reason you try to close a tab, and then Google is going to prevent you. The first thing it's going to show you is, hey, if you do this, you're going to lose all your data. I can't tell you how many lives Google has saved just by doing that alone. Because a lot of times the computer, you want to shut it down, you forgot you're filling this form, and now you get that. But let me show you something that is even more exciting. What about if you park at a sweep zone? And then, like, you could pay, I don't know how much you're going to pay, I don't know how much Tulsa charges, but you could pay a really huge fine. And your system can tell you that, hey, don't park here, or this is not the best place to park. You can leave. Can you imagine how you would feel like, it's like somebody who cares for you, who just constantly watches and checks like what is going on in your life and try to prevent you from making that bad choice. So that's what a friction design does. It puts things that makes you think twice. The third thing we get into is a driver design. And this takes it even further towards getting to that delightful state. And what it does is it aims to improve what a user accomplishes with the smallest, with the smallest effort possible. And like I said, it's one step closer to a delightful experience. And this is me trying to book a flight. And then I get these dollar signs on um, some of the seats, and I have no idea how much they cost, which is very weird. So if I want to check out the, yellow, the orange colored seats, how many times am I going to click? Seven. Seven times, just to know how much it costs. So I decided to change that. And now, how many times do I click? Zero. That's it. I just improved this entire experience from seven clicks to zero. And the user, the user wouldn't even recognize that I did anything if I made that change. That's the idea. It is so seamless that it is almost invisible, or literally invisible. So the last and the most important one is the anticipatory design. This one is so cool because you can use the past choices or the present intent of a user to predict or facilitate a future action. So this is what would get you to that delightful experience. By the time you implement the friction, the driver, the anticipatory, after the system, you're going to get there. So let me show you a very perfect example. This, is a, this isn't me, but this is a, someone's message. Um, and the last question is, where are you? This is what could happen. Where are you? And immediately you get a share location, and that's it. Now, if you want to share your, your location, what you do is after you leave this app, you have to go to your map, or you have to go to some other application, open it, go to the user's name, click it. You can just get that. And in one button, that's it. It is so seamless. It anticipates. Now, you, don't, you might not share your location, but the point is it has offered you that possibility to do that. Now, a very good case is Uber. I don't know if they still do this, but at some point, if you move from point A to B, and you go back to the Uber app, it's going to show you return. Because there's every chance you're going to go back to where you came from. At least 90% of people go back from where they came from. So Uber gives you a return, which means you don't have to enter that address anymore. 
You don't have to click on the search bar. You don't have to do all of that. In one button, it's going to use all of your previous choices. This is such a cool way to put in that delight. It's like the system just knows you, and it works for you. All of this tries to achieve one thing, a natural human state. We all want everything to work for us. I mean, we have a lot of bad systems, but we all want everything to work for us. Like, if you call, you have every intention for the person to answer. If you call, you have every intention for it to go true. We all have all of these really cool intentions, and this is what it is that non-UI tries to achieve. Getting to the natural human state means that our design has to be invincible. Invincible means that the user can use it without even recognizing that things are going on, just like the share button. It's like this guy. I don't know I mean, if you saw this meme, but really, it goes from a state where you can see it to when you can no longer see it. The Norman is one of the greatest people in the field of UX, and this is what it says. Good design is invincible design. It's a design you do not see, but you just enjoy. So let's consider a very good case study for something we all use every day that is not a digital product. The designs, and this is the ketchup. And the problem with it, there, there's so many problems with this bottle, but one of them is that it just comes out too slow. And the reason for that is gravity. The way it's standing, gravity means it's going to come out too slow, technically. And what did it decide to do? They flipped it around. OK, that's smart, but that's not how bottles work. Like, we all know this is not a natural state of a bottle. This is a natural state. This is a rational state. And these are two design things you would deal with all the time, a natural way people behave or a rational way. What eyes did was they avoided something that is very important to get to the rational way, innovation. So the guys at MIT supports my own logic that they're supposed to innovate. And this is a bottle that can actually bring out all of your ketchup, literally all of it, and eyes didn't do it. But MIT did it. So, if you're meant to do this, how is that bottle going to look? It doesn't need to be flipped over. It can be in its natural state. What this means is that you cannot implement non-UI without, without accepting the fact that you must innovate. It's going to stretch you. It's going to make you think about, if you want to get to that place where users can naturally use this, then it will require you to implement things that you've never done before. Let's use something that is very simple without having to go through the innovation of MIT. Check out, this is LinkedIn. And this is what, when you open the app for the first time, like a million apps out there, the first thing you see is notification, which is the very terrible thing. Uh, if, you're, if you're a developer, don't do it. You, chances are 90% of people are going to say no. And that's because it makes no sense. That's how you welcome into your house. It's like, just give me a notification. So LinkedIn decided to do something in line with what non-UI is suggesting. So when you open LinkedIn for the first time now, it doesn't show you a notification. It gives you nothing. It lets you use the application. Let's say you go to chat with Bill Gates. That would be cool if you actually do. But let's say you go to chat with him, and you send him a message. Then this is what LinkedIn does. Now, who wouldn't want to get notified when Bill Gates replies? Just this implementation alone, saw them increase the opt-in rate for the notifications by 500%. That's crazy. And all it took was just understanding the intent of the user. If I'm going to send a message to someone of the status of Bill Gates, there's every chance that I want to know if they get back to me. So this is how you can use it on a very small scale without breaking any type of innovation. And it's, it's such an important, simple thing that it just makes it seamless. Imagine at this point, when you get a notification, you actually appreciate LinkedIn for letting you know that it wants to alert you when Bill Gates replies, as compared to the other way around, where you felt this was more salesy. So let's talk about the benefits. I'm just going to give you three of them. The first one is product. Innovation is something your product is going to live by. You can build features, not just features, you can build value features because now you understand the intent of your users, you understand what you want to accomplish. Likewise, this means you can increase your retention and in-person recommendation. Everybody talks about a good product. Heck, I just talked about Lemonade. Everybody does, and they do it for free. Likewise, you can also increase your user satisfaction. The second part is the business. Of course, if you have a very good brand, you're going to increase your revenue. 
But the bigger part is you can even find better ways to monetize your product. Because once you start understanding the intent of users, it allows you to innovate, which means you can actually even build vertical products. And the last one, you can drastically reduce customer complaints because your product just works. Nobody complains for something that works. The third is you will be at the forefront of innovation. That is fact. Eins didn't think that way because it was just too difficult, but you would be at the forefront of innovation and you can further personalize the experience. So, non-UI is still a very early concept. It still has some ways to go, and this is something I want you to keep in mind. While it is really cool and it can help you get to that delightful experience, when it feels like your users can just go through it, you have to consider that you might not be able to implement everything at that time, you might not have the resource, you might not have the time, you might be limited by some factors, and that's something to consider. Something else to, to consider as well is, non-UI might not be best for heavy interaction applications like games. Games require users to do a lot of stuff. That's literally what they live for. You don't want to reduce that. You actually want to increase it to some extent. Also, this is going to vary from companies to determine what is that least amount of effort you want, the job, you want the users to make in your product. And based on your skill, based on your talent, based on business need or whatever it is, it could be one, it could be two, it could be three, it could be four, whatever it is. Um, two more things to consider is sometimes it's good for users to take an action. It's not always the case that users should take no action. You want to give them some kind of... Uh, a learning curve, but one that makes sense, like what LinkedIn did. You know, they said, hey, turn on your notification, but it makes sense to turn on the notification at that point. So sometimes it's good for the users to take an action and not just reduce all of the actions. And research is also a good part. It could reveal more things in non-UI. You don't necessarily need it um, because of how simple it is to implement, but research is going to do a very good job. So we thought about all of this restrictions and how we can improve non-UI, taking it from just a design approach to something else. So if I get the opportunity to be here again, I'm going to tell you the next phase of non-UI, which is the framework. Thank you very much.